clap, clap. Holy crap. The applause. Holy Gonna be a great lecture today, I guess. Gonna be a great lecture today, I guess. Whoa, how's the sound now? Hello. Hello. Holy cow, I don't know what that was. Hello. Holy cow, I don't know what that was. Hello. Holy cow, I don't know what that was. Hello. Holy cow. Oh, I know what the problem is. I've got it fixed. Okay. Is everybody all right? Okay, I'm still figuring out the technology. I do apologize for that. Let's see. The sound is okay now. I apologize for that. I'm still working the technology out. Oh my goodness. It's good to see you, Travis, Alexandra. Fantastic. Can you folks see the chat on the screen uh, that's popping up underneath me? It looks a little uh, blurry to me. What What's your uh, perception of the chat in the... Is it blurry or good? I've asked the wrong question. Yes, I'm not sure if you're saying it's, oh, it's good. Okay, fantastic, cool. All right, before we get started, I wanted to congratulate uh, the winners from our Kahoot last week. It looks like 40 of you participated in the weekly Kahoot, and I'd like to congratulate KBH, Kayla A, and CM for answering the questions the most accurately and also the quickly. Congratulations. Uh, those of you who are logged in right now, did you enjoy the Kahoot? Did you find it interesting? If you would, go ahead and type in the chat bar. What I was thinking about doing was putting a, I don't know what you might call a practice multiplayer uh, Kahoot so I'm going to take this and put this somewhere where you can play it a bunch of times and use it as a study tool if you like. Hopefully that'll be helpful for everyone. Okay, while I'm waiting for your responses, I'll just go ahead and carry on to, with our lecture. All right, so today we are talking about Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is all about biological psychology. So everything else that we're going to talk about in this book can be reduced to biological matter contained in this thing we'll call the nervous system. So your attitudes, your feelings, your cognitions, your personality, everything is going to be controlled and ultimately created by the biological uh, 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 structures under underlying uh, these functions. So what we're going to do today and tomorrow is go over a little a basic introduction to the nervous system for you. Today we're going to be talking specifically about neurons, neurotransmitters, and how the brain communicates in between uh, individual nerve cells. Good morning, KB. You missed it. You showed up a little bit late, or uh, a little bit late. Uh, I was actually giving you a kudos for uh, for winning the con the contest this weekend, folks. This is KBH, uh, our winner of Week One Kahoot. All right, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the organization of the nervous system. I'm going to talk about the anatomy and physiology of the neuro the neuron. We're going to introduce the idea of neurotransmitters, which are chemicals by which neurons communicate with one another. We're going to talk about how psychoactive drugs work, or not, neuromodulators is what I'm going to call them. And then we're briefly going to mention hormones as a form of neural communication. So if we could, let's go ahead and flip to uh, the first page of the discussion. Okay, so, uh-oh. 
Why did my slide deck go away? Did my slide deck go away? It surely did. Hmm. That's unfortunate. If you folks give me a minute, why did it do this to me? Okay. This is nice. Technology is doing me right today. Okay. There it is. It's back. All right. There we go. KB and his award. Chapter 2 Neurotransmitters. Oh, okay, okay, I had a blank slide in there. All right, fair enough. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're talking about the nervous system the next couple of days, and we're going to be talking about two kinds of cells in the nervous system, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are one-way communication cells in your nervous system. These are the mechanisms by which you transmit information from your arms and your fingers all the way to your brain so your brain knows what your fingers are touching. And it's the way in which your brain transmit information to your fingers so your fingers will know what to do uh, based upon your current needs and desires. Now, your neurons are electrocommunicating cells. They are supported by these cells called glial cells. Glial is the Greek for glue. And glial cells are kind of like support structures that speed up the neural communication and they also insulate your neurons. And in fact, your glial cells outnumber your neurons 10 to 1. So if you look at your brain, your spinal cord, and every nerve that you have in your body, they're composed of neurons that are insulated by glial cells. Now, your chapter two, uh, in chapter two, it's going to start off with a quick organizational structure that shows you uh, how the nervous system is organized. And what I want you to understand is we've got 100 billion neurons, so we sort of need to organize them into different areas. Your brain uh, and your spinal cord are what we call the central nervous system because they're responsible for receiving information and making decisions. Now, your brain controls your bodily processes, your organs, uh, your visceral organs, um, and your voluntary muscles. Uh, and and your voluntary movements, that's your brain, and then your spinal cord actually re controls reflex movement. So if you've ever been to the doctor and had the doctor smack you on the knee with the, uh, with the little hammer and your knee jerks forward, that's a reflex. That's actually controlled by your spinal cord. So your brain and your spinal cord are the control centers of your nervous system where you decide how you're going to act, where you're going to act, how, what chemical you're going to secrete or not secrete. And then we're going to contrast that with all of the other nerves in your body, which we'll call peripheral nerves. And that's the communication that goes from your brain, which is your central nervous system, all the way down to the end of your fingertip. That is your peripheral nerves. And so when uh, doctors sometimes talk about brain damage, they will ask whether or not it is central or peripheral. That means was your brain damaged or was a nerve outside of your brain or spinal cord damaged. And your peripheral nerves can be organized into two systems. Those nerves that control your internal organs, we'll call that the autonomic nervous system. And those nerves that control your muscles, we'll call that the somatic or the body uh, nervous system, right? So this is just a way to organize these 100 billion nerves in your nervous system. Now, up here, if you look uh, in, under the description of neurons, I said that neurons are one-way communicator cells. That is true. Neuro, uh, neurons communicate information one way uh, in one direction. That is from their cell body or their nucleus out this root-like structure called an axon. They send pulses of electricity one particular direction. So if you think about it, in order to control your finger, you need to have a nerve that goes from your finger all the way to your brain, right? So that your brain knows what's happening in your finger. And then you need a neuron that goes all the way from your brain to your finger so that you can move your neuron, move your finger. And so we can, typically, we can think of neurons in terms of whether or not they are uh, causing an action to occur or receiving input. So we talk about them as being either sensory or motor neurons. So a motor neuron is an outgoing neuron. So your brain, your somatosensory cortex, which controls your body, sends a motor neuron or an afferent neuron to your finger and causes it to move. 
And then your motor or sensory cortex also receives, if, if you will, an efferent or it receives information from that particular body part. So every part of your brain is going to be controlled, is going to be composed of afferent neurons and efferent neurons. Afferent neurons go are leaving that particular brain part, and efferent neurons are those neurons that are bringing uh, information into a particular brain part. And so think about your brain as just being composed of all of these different circuits, each one sending information out and each one rescinding information in via these one-way roads, okay? Uh, do we have any questions so far? We've got seven people watching. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in or you can send me a remind text. I do have my phone right here beside me. All right. So do you understand the idea between motor or, or afferent and efferents? So the frontal part of your brain, this little orbitofrontal cortex is what controls your personality, this little spot right here. And it has neurons that leave this area telling you other parts of your brain to do stuff. Those are the afferents from you. Those are what we would call your orbitofrontal afferents. They're leaving. And then your personality area is also receiving input, and those would be cool, called orbitofrontal efferents. Okay? Now, one thing that you, that you need to know if you're an introductory psychology student is the anatomy of the neuron. So the anatomy and the physiology of a neuron is uh, a basic understanding that you have to have when you leave this particular class. Oh my goodness, you know what I forgot? Hold on just a second. Did I forget to, did I forget to tell you about the videos for this? I think I did, folks. Hold on just a second, chapter 2A. Oh, 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 okay, okay, I get it. I know why that slide was blank. All right, no big deal. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is discuss briefly the anatomy uh, and physiology of a neuron. A neuron is just a very specialized cell. You folks have taken biology class, you know that the human body is composed of cells, these individual units that each has a job. Well, uh, neurons are nothing but communication cells that you will find in your body. Now, uh, neurons comes in all, come in all shapes and sizes, from microscopic neurons to neurons that actually have root-like structures which may be a foot or two long. They come in all different shapes as well. However, in most introductory classes, you will see the neuron uh, shape that you see right up here in front of you. This is what we'll call the prototypical or the most common neuron. And what I'd like to do is describe briefly the features of this neuron. Now, what I want you to know is, uh, remind you, is that this neuron is a one-way communicating cell. It's a one-way road. And the information travels from the thing called the cell body, you'll see here on the left side of your screen, to the terminal buttons, which is the right side of the screen. Do you see that? And then it connects with the next neuron's cell body, and the information travels from that cell body down its root-like structure. So neurons are one-way communicating cells. So in starting from left to right, they receive sensory information from other neurons, and then they may decide to communicate to other neurons uh, going the other way. So hopefully you see this one-way uh, communication pathway of your basic neurons. Now what I'd like to do is to talk about the different parts of these neurons and what they do during this communication process. Now, neurotrans, uh, excuse me, neurons communicate two ways. They communicate with electricity and they communicate with chemicals. All right. Now, each neuron has a bunch of dendrites that are root-like structures that are sensitive to a particular chemical type we'll call a neurotransmitter. There are a hundred different neurotransmitters in your brain, and each dendrite may be sensitive to one or two or three of these different kinds of neurotransmitters. All right. So these dendrites have little proteins on them that are sensitive to chemicals, these neurotransmitters. 
if they're stimulated, they take that information and transmit it to the cell body. Now, dendrites receive two kinds of information. They receive excitatory information and they receive inhibitory information. So some neurotransmitters say, don't send a message, all right? And other neurotransmitters say, send a message. And so each dendrite is going to be sitting there waiting to receive chemical stimulation. And if it receives a lot of chemical stimulation telling it to get excited, it's going to want to generate a pulse of electricity. If it gets a lot of chemical stimulation telling it uh, not to get excited, then it won't generate a pulse of electricity. Now, your cell body is sort of the control center of your neuron. It takes care of the basic physiological processes of a cell that every other cell has taken care of. It. So it has uh, genetic material, it has ribosomes, it has uh, chromosomes, it has uh, organelles, all the basic uh, physiological structures in a neuron. And it also has a space on it called an axon hillock, which is right there where it joins the axon. And what happens is this axon hillock receives the chemical input from the dendrites and it decides whether or not it's going to generate a pulse of electricity called an action potential. If it gets enough stimulating chemicals, it will generate a pulse of electricity which runs down the length of this long root-like structure called an axon. Okay? Now, if it doesn't, if it receives too much in inhibition, inhibiting, inhibiting chemicals, then it won't send an action potential. And so every second, the cell body, the axon hillock at the cell body is receiving chemical input. And every second, it's deciding whether or not it's going to generate a pulse of electricity. So if you're stimulating a neuron, it's going to start gen generating action potentials and you can actually listen to them with sort of with a, a single cell recording technique and you hear and it sounds like a Geiger counter. Pop, 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 pop. When it's being stimulated and it's generating these pulses of electricity that run all the way down the length of the axon. Now the neat thing is some axons can be very short if one part of a brain is communicating with another part of a brain the little axon or the root-like structure won't project very far but there are some axons which are literally a foot or two that go from your spinal column all the way out to a particular body part. And all an axon is, is it's a connecting roadway that allows a cell body to send a pulse of electricity to another part of your body. Now, if you'll look at this particular design, you'll notice that this cell body doesn't communicate uh, a very long distance with the next cell. That's a very short axon. Some axons are super short, some axons are super long. In this particular example, it's a fairly short axon. Now, what I want you to focus on is the terminal buttons, which are the end spots, the end of the root uh, of the axon root. And you'll notice that there, it is sort of uh, it looks like a branch-like structure just like your uh, dendrites. And each of these terminal buttons ends fairly close to a spot on these dendrites. And what you've got are little chemical neurotransmitters contained in these terminal buttons. We're going to talk about them in a minute. And what happens is when that brief pulse of electricity gets all the way to the end of the axon, it causes each of these terminal buttons to release their chemicals, which then stimulate the next neuron. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Now, you'll notice uh, right down here at the bottom of the screen, I ask you to watch the two minute neuroscience video, Neuroanatomy, located in your uh, chapter resources folder. Uh, and it will explain this particular process and use some video animation so that it, uh, so that it makes sense to you. It's really hard to describe this uh, um, in a PowerPoint presentation, so you should definitely use this video. It will help you understand what I'm talking about. Now, your axons, if you'll notice around your axon, you've got these myelin sheath, which is basically these glial cells I told you. And what happens is they grow along the axons after you're born and they insulate them. 
and they actually speed up the action potential, the electrical impulse, so that it causes your neurons to communicate more efficiently with one another. In fact, there are dis disorders like uh, uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, is what we call a demyelination disorder. And what happens in this disorder is this myelin tissue begins to disintegrate around the axons in your spinal column and it causes you to start stop uh, to lose control over body parts and eventually it kills you because your brain can't communicate with your lungs and heart to tell them to keep breathing and functioning all right so i'm going to move on what i want you to know for the exam is i want you to know dendrites cell body axon terminal buttons and I might even ask you to know them in the correct order and use this little mnemonic DCBA ABCD backwards dendrites cell body axon and then your neurotransmitters are contained in the terminal buttons okay so this is the one-way transmission uh, direction of your uh, of the axon now Here's the deal, when the terminal button, when the action potential gets to the end of the terminal button, this is a blow up of the terminal button you'll see right here. So the action potential has come all the way down to the end of the axon and you'll notice there's this little bump like structure. It contains neurotransmitters, little neurotransmitter molecules. When stimulated by an action potential, it releases these neurotransmitters into a little gap between neurons called the synapse. The crazy thing is, even though you've got 100 million neurons, none of them actually touch. They come very close to one another. And this electrical signal travels all the way down. And then in the terminal button, when they're stimulated by the action potential, they release these little chemicals into the synaptic gap right here. And it transmits either an excitatory message or an inhibitory message to the postsynaptic receptor site. Now, uh, we typically call the terminal button presynaptic because that's before the synapse, and we call the dendrite postsynaptic because that's after the synapse. And the neurotransmitters are released right here in this little synaptic gap. They float across the synaptic gap, they send their signal, they lock in with a protein, activate that protein one time, and then they're sucked right back up into the terminal button in a process we call reuptake. Okay, now you'll notice at the bottom of this screen, I've actually got a two minute neuroscience video for this that shows you in a, uh, in, in a video animation exactly what this process looks like. Please, please, please take a look at this video. Okay, now, so, uh, there are lots of different types of chemicals in your nervous system that allow one neuron to communicate with another. It turns out that there are almost a hundred neurotransmitters uh, or that is chemicals that work at the level of the synapse that allow one, neurotrans one neuron to communicate with another neuron. However, uh, seven of the neuron neurotransmitters uh, seven of these 100, 100 neurotransmitters really do a majority of the work. So what I want you to know for the exam is I want you to be familiar with the function of the seven basic neurotransmitters listed in table 2.1. All right, neurotransmitters are simply molecules that are released from a neuron that communicates with another neuron. Some neurotransmitters are excitatory. They cause the next neuron to want to send an action potential. Some neurons are inhibitory. They always tell the next neuron to calm down and don't send action potential. Don't send an action potential. And most neurotransmitters can be excitatory or inhibitory depending upon where they are released. Okay, so your book, uh, in, uh, your book talks about norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Adrenaline that is secreted in the peripheral nervous system around the heart causes neurons to send more action potentials and causes your heart to beat faster. 
adrenaline released in your frontal lobe is actually inhibitory and causes you to be able to sit down, shut up, and pay attention. So neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory, depending upon where they're released, or some of them may be excitatory or only inhibitory. I hope that makes sense. Um, so, uh, acetylcholine is responsible for motor control and paying attention. People who have ADHD typically take medications to help magnify the amount of acetylcholine in their brain. They don't have enough acetylcholine, so it's hard for them to pay attention. Acetylcholine causes the focusing part of your brain to work, to work better. Okay, norepinephrine is uh, an arousal and uh, awakeness neurotransmitter. Okay, it's responsible for arousal, regulating your arousal. Uh, if any of you have ever been diagnosed with depression, you probably take a drug that, that uh, magnifies the amount of serotonin in your brain. Serotonin is a mood-related neurotransmitter. Okay. Dopamine. Dopamine is a reward, uh, a reward neurotransmitter. Uh, when you eat a candy bar, when you have sex, when you win a uh, a Kahoot contest, your brain is going to release dopamine, and you're going to uh, get that sense of reward. If you use drugs they act in the dopamine pathway. So dopamine is responsible uh, for rewards. Now, uh, there are people who have a disorder called Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease, what happens in their brain is the part of their brain, uh, the substantia nigra, which is responsible for producing dopamine, those neurons begin to die off, and the person doesn't have enough dopamine in their system. So they have to take stuff called levodopa or L-dopa, which their brain turns into dopamine. Now, if you've ever been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, your brain is probably not producing enough GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. I'll just ask you to remember GABA on the exam. GABA is inhibitory. It's uh, primarily an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it's associated with the feeling of being relaxed. So people who take Xanaxes to calm down, uh, Xanax acts just like GABA and causes your system to relax. Glutamate is responsible for learning. Uh, it's a learning uh, neurotransmitter. And then endorphins are your body's natural painkiller. From what I understand, endorphins were the first neurotransmitter discovered. And they were so normed, named because it's an endorphous morphine-like substance. The first scientist said, hey, this is an endorphous morphine-like substance. And they put those two together, endorphous morphine, and came up with endorphin. So you can think of endorphin as your brain's natural painkiller. If any of you run or jog or lift weights, you know how you push yourself and it hurts and it hurts and hurts. And then you get that runner's high where suddenly your body starts to feel great. Your body is releasing endorphins, which allow you to feel good. That sort of kills the pain in your body. Uh, on the exam, I would like for you to match each of these neurotransmitters with their common effects. Okay. Uh, Last slide, and then we're going to let you go. All right, so here's the deal. Some general notes about uh, neurons. Remember, they communicate one way. Each neuron generates an action potential. When that action potential gets to the end of that neuron, it causes that neuron to release its chemicals, called neurotransmitters, out of the terminal buttons into the synapse. They travel across the synapse and communicate with the next neuron. Those, those uh, neurotransmitters may either tell it to send an action potential, they may be excitatory, or they may tell it not to send an action potential, they may be inhibitory. The axon hillock, uh, which is part of the uh, cell body, takes the incoming information, compares the inhibitory messages to the excitatory messages. If it gets enough excitatory messages compared to inhibitory message, it will generate an action potential. And remember, this is happening a hundred million times in your brain 
every second each neuron is receiving input and deciding whether or not it's going to send information send a message to another part of your nervous system any questions so far I'm probably gonna keep you about five more minutes today folks all right now uh, Here's the thing, uh, what is a psychoactive drug? A psychoactive drug is any molecule or chemical that is small enough to get through the blood-brain barrier up into your nervous system, up into your central nervous system, your brain, and acts like a neurotransmitter. So any molecule that can get into your brain and fits the same receptor site that neurotransmitters does, is what we call a psychoactive chemical. Uh, so um, uh, caffeine can do that. It's a psychoactive chemical. Alcohol can do that. It's a psychoactive chemical. Prescription medication uh, for depression can do that. It's a psychoactive drug. So any chemical that can get through that fatty barrier, so you have a filter that keeps all the garbage out of your brain. But any molecule that's small enough to slip through that filter is what's known as a psychoactive drug. Let's not call them psychoactive. Let's call them modulators, neuromodulators. Because what they do is they just change the functioning in your brain by either magnifying the effect of some neurotransmitters or working to inhibit the effect of some neurotransmitters. Now this point may be a little bit complex and hard to get across in a video. So what I would do is I would highly suggest that you watch the mouse party, play the mouse party uh, game that I've got listed in the resources folder. It's a great demonstration of how the six uh, most common uh, psychoactive drugs work at the level of the synapse to affect your psychological functioning. So it's got an alcohol demonstration, a marijuana demonstration, a crystal meth demonstration, a cocaine de uh, de demonstration, and a demonstration of LSD. And it shows you how all of these molecules work to neuromodulate the functioning of your naturally occurring neurotransmitters. Remember, an agonist is any drug that magnifies the effect of a neurotransmitter. Do any of you take SSRIs? Anybody take SSRIs or heard of the concept of SSRIs? Please, you don't have to type that in. Um, but an SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What it does is it prevents the reuptake of serotonin. So it magnifies artificially the amount of serotonin in your brain. As I told you, serotonin is a mood elevator. If you're depressed, you don't have enough in it of this in your brain. So what we do is we give you a drug that magnifies the amount of serotonin in your brain. If you take Xanax, if you've ever taken a Xanax for anxiety, it is also a GABA uh, agonist what it does is it magnifies the amount of GABA in your brain and GABA causes you to be relaxed so both of these drugs are what we would call agonists they modulate the chemicals in your brain and they actually multiply the effect of these chemicals in your brain so I hope that makes sense and then finally antagonist is any neuromodulator that minimizes or works the against the effect of neurotransmitters now it turns out we think that uh, the reason some people suffer from schizophrenia is because their brain is presenting prevent is is creating too much dopamine so we think too much dopamine is associated with schizophrenia so Thorazine, which is the first neuromodulator ever developed back in the early 50s, it actually works by uh, being an antagonist to dopamine. So it works to minimize the effect of dopamine in your system. And it turns out that people that take Thorazine have less hallucinations. So the Thorazine uh, tends to affect dopamine overproduction, which we think is related to hallucinations. Does anybody have any questions? So I do want you to understand on the exam the difference between a neuromodulating drug and a 
uh, or excuse me, before an agonist neuromodulator and an antagonist neuromodulator. Okay, last thing I want to mention before I let you go, the endocrine system. Now, uh, not only do our brains communicate at the level of the synapse, right in between neurons, but we actually release chemicals into our blood system that travel around our entire blood system, working at synapses all over the brain. So neurotransmitters work locally. Okay, a uh, transmitter is released right here and it works right here. And in, uh, a hormone is released uh, from one of your uh, 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 endocrine glands and it travels through your blood system and it works systematically. But it still works just like a neurotransmitter. It works on synapses, but it works systematically. Your book talks uh, about hormones. They work slow instead of fast and they work systemically instead of locally, unlike neurotransmitters, that's the difference. In your book, we're gonna talk about two in uh, particular this semester, we're gonna, uh, gonna talk about uh, testosterone or estrogen, which are sex hormones, and we're gonna talk about them in chapter 10 and how they relate to sexual development. And then we're also gonna be talking about cortisol, which is a stress hormone released by your adrenal glands. And in chapter 11, we're gonna talk about all of the systemic effects that are caused when your body decides to release cortisol. Do we have any questions? That's about all I had to say today. Thank you very much for those of you who stayed through the entire lecture. Uh, do to do, let me, uh-oh, where's my, doggone it. I don't have my conclusion. So we're just gonna get back here. Hey, Ken, here uh, is, take a picture of this. This is your glory. Uh, oh my goodness. Goodness, I flip-flopped flip all the way back and forth. Okay, good enough. I'm not sure why I'm not getting the uh, concluding screen. My presentation was all messed up today. I'll do better tomorrow. If you don't have any questions, I will let you go. Uh, good luck. Don't forget to do the, uh, uh, don't forget to uh, read your textbook, keep up with the lectures. Uh, you can, oh, you can start the weekly homework at any time. You do not have to do it in one sitting. You can open it up today and work on it for 45 hours in a row. You just cannot submit it. So there's a save and a submit button. All right, so what you do is you can open your homework, answer some questions, and then hit the save button, and then watch another lecture, and then open your homework back up, and uh, do some more of it, and then hit the save button. And you can hit save as many times as you want. Just don't hit submit until you're ready to turn your homework in. So don't feel like you have to do this as an exam all in one sitting. You can take as long as you want. In fact, I want you to take a long time and get a 100 on this homework assignment. Okay? Well, uh, without, if, if that's all, um, I don't know what else to say. I'm gonna go ahead and let you go and I will see you uh, tomorrow. Take care. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory and call again or ask your operator for assistance. This is a recording.